So what went wrong? How did we go from Bob Dylan to Britney Spears, from Led Zeppelin to Lady Gaga, and The Kinks to Katy Perry? But who am I to criticise the musical tastes of the vast majority of today's youth? Personally, my musical tastes are stuck in the middle of last century, but you may think that just makes me old-fashioned, stuck in the past, and I should probably move with the times. But here's the thing. There is far more to this than simple nostalgia, and when your parents keep telling you that the music died long ago, they may actually have a point. Because it turns out that science agrees with them. Over the past 30 plus years, researchers have been studying how trends in music have evolved. And a recent study in 2012 by the Spanish National Research Council revealed that the suspicions of somewhat antiquated individuals, such as myself, are very true. Music is getting worse every year. The researchers took around 500,000 recordings from all genres of music from the period of 1955 to 2010. And they meticulously ran every single song through a set of complex algorithms. These algorithms measured three distinct metrics of each song. The harmonic complexity, the timbral diversity, and loudness. The most shocking result that the researchers found was that over the past few decades, Tambra in songs has dropped drastically. Tambra is the texture, colour, and the quality of the sounds within the music. In other words, the song's richness and depth of sound. The researchers found that timbral variety peaked in the 1960s and has since been steadily declining. The timbral palette has been homogenised, meaning songs increasingly have less diversity with their instruments and recording techniques. This divide is clearly evident if we take what is widely considered to be the Beatles' masterpiece, A Day in the Life, which was recorded using an orchestra of 40 musicians. But this is not classical music, this is pop. The five minute piece contains violins, violas, cellos, double bass, harp, clarinets, an oboe, bassoons, flutes, French horns, trumpets, trombones, a tuba, and of course, the four band members playing their usual instruments over the top. In contrast, Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines uses mostly one instrument, a drum machine. And yes, this is a rather extreme example, a song known for its one-dimensional but punchy bassline, but it represents an overall trend with modern pop music that the researchers found within their data. Instead of experimenting with different musical techniques and instruments, the vast majority of pop today is built using the exact same combination of a keyboard, a drum machine, sampler, and computer software. This might be considered as progressive by some people, but in truth, it sucks the creativity and originality out of music, making everything sound somewhat similar. Do you ever flick through the radio and think to yourself, all these songs sound the same? Well, what the researchers found is that the melodies, rhythms, and even the vocals of popular music have become more and more similar to each other since the 60s. One facet of this homogenization of popular music was pointed out by musical blogger Patrick Metzger. Metzger noticed that hundreds of pop artists were using the exact same sequence of notes, in which there's a shift from the fifth note in a scale to the third note, and then back to the fifth. This sequence of notes is usually accompanied by a vocal wah-o wah-o pattern. Metzger named this the Millennial Whoop, and it sounds like this. Whoa, 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 whoa. The Millennial Whoop can be found in hundreds of chart-topping pop songs created over the past few years, and its usage is becoming more frequent all the time, from Katy Perry's California Girls to Justin Bieber's Baby, literally every single major pop star today has included the Millennial Whoop in at least one of their songs. But why? Well, quite simply, familiarity. Our brain likes familiarity. The more we hear the same sounds, the more we enjoy them. The Millennial Whoop has become a powerful and predictable way to subconsciously say to the masses, hey, listen to this new song, it's really cool. But don't worry, you will like it because it's also really familiar. Because you've actually heard it hundreds of times before. 
And in this wildly unpredictable world, this makes us feel safe. Sticking to the same cookie cutter formula comforts people, and that's important. But what about lyrics? Well, I'm afraid it's bad news there too. Another study examined the so-called lyric intelligence of hundreds of billboard chart-topping songs over the past 10 years. They use different metrics, such as the flesher kincaid Readability Index, which indicates how difficult a piece of text is to understand and the quality of the writing. This was the result. Over the past 10 years, the average lyric intelligence has dropped by a full grade. Lyrics are also getting shorter and tend to repeat the same words more often. We've gone from the absolute poetic beauty of Bob Dylan and Morrissey to, well, this and this. What if I also told you that the vast majority of chart-topping music in the past 20 years was written by just two people? What do Britney Spears, Taylor Swift, Ellie Goulding, Robin Thicke, Jesse J, Justin Bieber, Katy Perry, Ariana Grande, Justin Timberlake, Maroon 5, Pink, Leona Lewis, Avril Lavigne, Christina Aguilera, Kesha, The Backstreet Boys, Westlife, NSYNC, Adam Lambert, and Will I Am all have in common? The answer, their songwriter. I'm not saying 100% of their songs, but a good chunk of all these artists' songs were written by the same Swedish man, a Mr. Max Martin. This one man is single-handedly responsible for over two dozen number one singles and thousands of songs in the top 100 charts over the past decades. He has written universally recognisable tracks such as I Kissed a Girl, Baby One More Time, Since You Been Gone, California Girls, Shake It Off and so, so many more. And if Max Martin didn't write it, then American singer-songwriter Lucas Gottwald most probably did. Known professionally as Dr. Luke, together with Max Martin, they account for the lyrics and melodies behind the vast majority of pop music today. You've likely never heard of them, and that is very intentional. These two men are the hidden pop factories behind virtually every single band that is played on the radio today, and probably every musical act you grew up with if you're under 30 years old. And you wondered why everything sounds the same. There are still popular chart-topping musicians that write the entirety of their own music today, but you have to look really, really hard. Research has also shown that the hook, the part of the song that really grabs us and pulls us in, is occurring sooner in modern songs and they happen more often. Researchers believe this is because when it comes to music, our attention spans have drastically shortened. Unless a song instantly grabs us, our brain tends to shut off and ignore it, often skipping to the next song. This shortened attention span is a trend amongst people that has only occurred in the past 10 years and it's believed to have been caused by the instant access to millions of songs at our fingertips. It used to be the case that if you wanted to hear a song, you had to go out and buy that one single or album, take it home and play it. You would probably play it countless times because you had spent so much money on so few songs. Over time, you would learn to appreciate all the subtle nuances throughout the album. And then the iPod happened granting access to thousands of songs on one device, which eventually led to streaming. Today, we flick through songs on Spotify without much thought to each song's subtleties and unique talents. This has caused musicians and record companies to favour punchy bass lines that demand our attention and to stuff each song full of so-called hooks to instantly grab our attention and keep it for as long as possible. And they've also been doing something else in recent years to grab our attention. Something subtle, but so very powerful, yet so very, very wrong. For the past 20 years, music producers have been engaged in a war. The loudness war. The aim of this war is to produce louder music than your competitors. But how do you make music louder when the listener is in control of the volume, not the producer? Well. They use compression, 
you may have heard of dynamic range compression. It's the process of boosting the volume of the quietest parts of a song so that they match the loudest parts, thus reducing the dynamic range, the distance between the loudest parts and the quietest parts. This makes the whole song sound much, much louder than the uncompressed version, no matter what volume the listener has set their device to. It's like me standing in the middle of the street and mumbling nonsense to myself, occasionally whispers and sometimes speaking a bit louder. A few people might notice and avoid me. But then, if I were to compress my dynamic range, I would suddenly be bellowing out every single word at the top of my voice loudly and proudly. Suddenly, everyone turns around to look at the crazy man shouting in the street and the police would be called. But this is exactly why producers do it. As the market has become increasingly crammed with similar sounding pop music, making your song shout louder than all the others ensures it will be heard amongst all the competition. But there's a big price to pay for loudness. Dynamic range compression, when abused as it often is today, is an absolute travesty when it comes to the art of creating music. Where physics is concerned, the rule is that you can't make a sound louder than the volume it was recorded at without reducing its quality. Compressing a song's dynamic range strips away its timbral variety. It muddies the sound, subtle nuances that would have before been very noticeable and could have been appreciated are now no longer nuanced. They sound exactly the same as the rest of the track. Listen to this short recording without any compression. Now hear what happens when the dynamic range is compressed to match that of modern pop music. Hear how everything sounds less punchy and vibrant? The drum beats stand out less, everything just makes less of an impact. But at the end of the day, there is a very real reason why popular musicians and producers today don't stray away from their safe haven of repetitive, monotonous drum machines, unimaginative factory-produced lyrics, rhythms stolen from the previous popular song then chopped up and changed slightly, and of course their ever-popular millennial whoops. It all has to do with risk. In the 50s, 60s and 70s, record labels would receive hundreds of demo tapes from budding young artists every week. They would sift through them and the most talented acts would be offered record contracts. Even if they weren't that special, it didn't matter too much. The record label would just throw a few thousand pounds into marketing and if the public liked their music, they would naturally gain traction and make it big. If not, they would fade away into the night. And this is crucial, because importantly, the public were voting with their ears for the best, the most talented musicians, singers and songwriters. We, the people, were the final judge and jury, the ultimate arbiter. And so musicians had to be really bloody talented to impress us enough to stick around and make more music. There was just no room for sloppiness or the untalented. But this method was risky because many times record labels would pump thousands of pounds into an act that weren't destined to be, and their gamble wouldn't pay off, losing their investment. But when they signed the really big acts, it would balance the books. However, today, promoting a new band is more expensive than ever. Over time, the cost of breaking in a new artist onto the global music scene has skyrocketed. In fact, the IFPI reports that today, it costs anywhere between half a million and three million dollars to sign a new act and break them into the music scene. That's a hell of a lot of money. Would you want to gamble with three million dollars? No, neither do music producers. So, the industry has reacted by removing the risk. Instead of trying to find genuine musical talent, they simply take a pretty young face, usually from a TV talent show, and then simply force the public to like them. 
by brainwashing them. Instead of allowing the public to grow to like an artist and make their own mind up about the quality of their music, the industry now simply makes you like their music, thus removing all the financial risk. 